Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I want to introduce, uh, I, did a, I did an intro to you earlier, Jerry. I called you a miracle man because I don't know how else to describe what you went through. Uh, Jerry Schimmel is a, is a, a plane crash, airline pr uh, crash survivor of one of the most, most horrific plane crashes I've ever seen. And it was all caught on video for the most part. Uh, back in 1989, July 16th, wasn't it? I think July, July 19th, July 19th yep. in 1989. Yep. I was a teenager. Um, I was probably 16 years old. I remember on the news. I remember watching as a kid. And um, to this day, I just I don't know what happened. I was watching something on my YouTube. I saw something on the feed about um, air traffic control bring helps people bring stuff in and a near airline disaster. And then I saw it, 232. I was like, oh, my gosh, I forgot all about that. And I saw your story when they're interviewing you on that. I think it was a BBC type of uh, in, uh, interview. They kind of had actors reenacting and whatnot. And so I'll let you take it from there. You were on the, you're in uh, Denver, Stapleton Airport. Yeah. And you're on the way to Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, full flight, uh, DC-10, Kevin, 296 people were aboard. So we're completely full. And uh, we're about halfway there. It's about a two-hour flight from Denver to Chicago. And we're about halfway there when we had an engine explosion, uh, which is really violent, sounded, you could, you could hear it, you could feel it come through the cabin. Um, and I thought a bomb had gone off. Honestly, I thought a terrorist had planted a bomb we, and it was detonated. We started to drop. And after about 30 seconds, we kind of eased up out of that drop a little bit and eventually leveled off. But uh, at that point, we were told that we were in serious trouble because the number two engine in DC-10, the tail section uh, engine, had exploded, according to our cockpit captain. It injured the rear of the aircraft, and we've been given an emergency landing to, to land in Sioux City, Iowa. Emergency landing meant you have to go through the, the emergency landing procedures, which we did. We practiced those. And uh, about 45 minutes later, we attempted that crash landing in Sioux City with the cockpit crew having Kevin so little control of the plane. We, they couldn't slow the plane down. A normal DC-10 landing is 125 or so miles an hour when you touch the ground. We hit it 255. They, they couldn't slow the airspeed down or they're going to lose control of the plane. So it's just a dangerous, crazy landing attempt. And uh, I think the cockpit crew did their best, but we hit the ground and broke into pieces, flipped over and as you know the result was that 112 people died out of the right. 296 296 board which to me when you mention that word miracle i'm with you on that kevin when it, when you look at that plane crash and there's videotape of it on the internet very very easy to find you wonder how anybody could have survived right. it looks like a, a crash of destruction where nobody could walk away but, even the captain's um, chair i mean they showed it yeah. in a little museum it's bent up a steel yes. chair bent like how yeah. is he not even I mean yeah. I know he passed away a couple of years ago, but how does he? How did he even walk? Not able to walk away, but I mean he was uh, able to live a normal life. Yeah, the um, you know the, the cockpit is its story in itself, miraculous. And that cockpit is seven and a half feet from from floor to ceiling normally. Right. And when it broke off, we hit the ground. It broke off the plane, rolled over, told, rolled over. They think between fifteen and twenty times, Kevin. I mean over and over, just kept rolling, and that seven and a half feet got compressed to three. And all four of those guys inside that cockpit survived. That's, you know, to me, that that's a miracle. That's incredible. So when you yeah. were, okay, so when you were, how long in the flight were you to the explosion happened? Uh, we were an hour in the flight when the explosion happened. And then after the explosion, 45 minutes before we touched the ground. So when you say violent, I, I can only imagine what it felt like, but like, was it like in your chest? Like, oh shit, like this is it kind of feeling like. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. When, when that uh, explosion took place, first you could, you could hear it. I could hear it come from the back of the plane and then I could feel it kind of ripped, kind of reverberate through the cabin from the back to the front. And then we started to drop. And, and I thought that was it. In fact, as we were dropping and the panic was happening around me, I was almost calmly asking myself a question that was how long does it take a dc-10 to drop thirty-seven thousand feet because because i i knew we were flying at 37,000 feet i had no idea how long it would take a plane because i want to know when we hit the ground and when everybody's going to be dead right so to answer your question yes i thought that was it when i that was it for everybody when i thought well that engine explosion has taken place we're going to slam down to the earth and where were you at like aircraft right aircraft left how far back from the front or how back from the tail yeah. Uh, 37 rows in a DC-10, so yeah. I'm in row 23, so I'm a little past the halfway point, yeah. back toward the back of the plane. I have an aisle on my right, and then across the aisle for me are two more seats. The DC-10 is nine seats across. I'm in the middle. 
Gotcha. So you're like right above the fuel tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. Um, okay. So then I, I, I remember the story, the captain was steering the plane with the power of the throttles powering engine one and engine three because it was making nothing but right turns correct yeah. so it yeah. almost rolled at one point from what I, from what he said and he powered this engine if you're facing the other way and it was able to kind of counteract the roll i mean for him to even know how to i mean he didn't really know how to do it this is fly i mean off the seat of his pants of how to steer this plane by using throttle which is unbelievable yeah. what he was able to do and yeah. i know that pilot the engineer and then you had the trainer that was in the back as a passenger and he was a trainer for a dc-10 i mean talk about you know a miracle again for this guy to even be on board to come up front and help take over controls to help i mean to do all this so i know the by watching the uh story and everything now was it was you're coming in for landing they said they were making right turns were they almost doing like a corkscrews to to yeah, come around to help try to slow the plane and aim it the correct direction. Yeah, well, first of all, you're right. The plane wouldn't go straight. It kept wanting to bank off to the right. So we, every time we got a heading for Sioux City, the plane on its own it would turn off to the right, and they have to come back and line up again. We did it five times. Oh, wow. That's why it took us so long. I mean, it should have taken about 15 minutes. It took 45. So, uh, and and that's all. And what and and like Captain Haynes said later on, he said we took that fifth turn. And there was the airport in front of us. So th th another just miraculous circumstance was that hey, on that fifth turn, they kind of tried to straighten out and, and there's the runway. So it was a shorter runway, I saw way. too. It was a short one where it wasn't built for a DC-10. So right. yeah, you're right. A lot of things came together in a, a DC-10 training instructor in the back coming up to help in the cockpit. That was miraculous. So yeah, a lot of things came together, I think, to help save lives that day. And for a lot of people who watch her watching this interview that don't know about the DC-10 is it has three hydraulic systems. And if one fails, you got two backup. If a second one fails, you have the third backup. What was, uh, in a not incredible way, but I mean, when the explosion happened in the back, it severed all three hydraulic systems. So that basically you are driving, it's almost like driving a car at three or 500 miles an hour on cruise control and you can't put it in park, you can't slow it down, you can't steer it. Right. I mean, this is what this is like. Yep. Uh, I could not imagine what was going through the pilot's minds, the passenger's minds. I mean, I know you lost your friend. I saw that also, you were you were traveling. Was he a childhood friend? No, he was uh, He was just a, a, an acquaintance of mine and also my boss. He had hired me about three months before the crash to, to work for him gotcha. in the uh, minor league system for the NBA. You know, yep. something that broke my heart on that interview I saw with the flight attendant and she was telling me or not telling me, she's telling the audience on the, on the interview that it makes her skin crawl to this day when she told the, the lady to hold her child on the floor yeah. and support. And then she said, of course, when the plane hit, the child perished. I mean, yeah. I, I could not imagine having to go through that. Uh, but again, yeah. let's, I want to talk about what, when the plane actually landed, I mean, the, the violent of that i mean you i mean the the explosion was violent enough let alone what you went through i mean the plane how many times the plane roll that you were in at least yeah it, it, we kind of flipped over kind of cartwheeled front forward and then the plane broke up into into big pieces and you know literally thousands of little ones so you know we flipped over and then that's when the devastation took place which is kind of hard to see in the video but right uh when you're inside the plane i, I felt it for sure when were you upside down when it stopped yeah, yeah. Well, so you're still uh, in your seat belt, and you had to undo yeah. the seat belt. Correct, now, when the plane yeah. hit, did you feel the heat from flames coming through the cabin, or no? I I, I didn't feel that heat. Um, I, I I saw that that flame kind of shoot from the front to back, and kind of right by him in the aisle. Um, but I didn't get burned by that. I didn't feel the heat, but it was definitely there. And you know that ruptured fuel tank, and we didn't have a lot of fuel left because Captain Haynes dump fuel, but. Yeah, what, what was remaining uh, it, it ruptured as soon as we hit the ground. And a story I want everyone to know about you too, Jerry, was some, it was incredible mm -hmm. what you did. You were walking out uh, almost, were you not completely unscathed, but for what you, I mean, how, well, how bad were you injured at the point? No, not, not bad. You know, my injuries came later, smoke inhalation and bruises and, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't bleeding. I didn't have any, you know, visual scars or burnt or anything like that. So no, I didn't, I, I felt fine after I got out of the plane initially. But you go back in as you walk out to help save that kid. Yeah. I mean, you it know, was, 
how old was the yeah. kid? And yeah, uh, eleven months, eleven months oh. old. So just a baby, just a crying baby. Yeah, it, and I finally got outside the plane, and and I, I followed everybody that had come out through this opening, the back of the plane. I had to kind of make my way to the back of the plane, probably you know, 15 rows to get back to where I could find a spot to get out and finally got out getting ready to run away from the aircraft because I was thinking an explosion at that point. And I just heard a baby crying back inside the wreckage and didn't think it through, Kevin. I didn't weigh any risks. I honestly didn't. I, I just found myself back in the plane over top the crying and grabbed a little baby girl uh, and pulled her out of the wreckage the second time. Goosebumps, man. Goosebumps. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's human. That's true human nature right there. I yeah. think anyone in that circumstance, it's hard to say what you would do, but here you're in a burning plane. And I, if you, anyone who watches the video of the plane crash, you'll see that when you talk about smoke inhalation, it's ungodly uh, how much smoke. And what people maybe don't know is airline fuel is a form of diesel. So when it ignites, it's extremely heavy, extremely black and thick. And to even inhale that, I mean, you could die or at least succumb of uh, pass out in a minute as much smoke as you were in it wasn't like a light draft of smoke it was you were in complete engulfed in this stuff yeah, so yeah. To, to go back in and save a, another human being is incredible jerry i mean it's that to me yeah. is a story in itself that you just did that i mean out of your pure just your, you know the, again human nature it just says wait there's a yeah. child. i gotta go save this kid exactly yeah i think you're exactly right on that kevin because I came out of this crash labeled a hero because I went back on the plane and grabbed this girl. And I, I never felt that, you know, I, I think a hero is somebody who thinks it through, who weighs that risk and then still does it. I didn't do any of that. I heard a baby crying and next thing I know I'm back inside the plane. And, you know, people say, well, I don't know if I would have done that or not. You would have done that. I mean, think about our circumstance. I, I had kids sitting all around me in that plane. Right. We knew we were going to crash. We were in a dire circumstance with young people, helpless kids, on a plane, what are you gonna do? Walk away when you hear a baby cry? No, you're gonna no. go do what I did. So you would do the same thing anybody in that circumstance would have. And and I think if you if you don't think that, I think you're kidding yourself. I really do. It's hard to say what people would do in that circumstance. It's just, but I think you're right. I think most people would turn back around and yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. I know you. Do you still keep up with up with a lot of the survivors now? Like keep in touch with them. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the entire uh, flight crew that's remaining of it anyway, there's Captain Haynes has passed away and another co-pilot, but the whole uh, remaining flight crew, I'm very close to a uh, number of survivors and really Kevin, probably more, probably closer to more families of people who died in the crash than I am probably survivors, which sounds yeah. kind of weird, but that's just kind of the way it's gone. Um, we, we no, it's like good you're friends. what's left of it. You know, they want to cling yeah. on to the memories and what you all yeah. went through the, yeah. yeah. You're right about that. Yeah. Um, so, like, can I ask you a question? Like, do you have issues like PTSD or anything like that from it? No, I, I don't. And I never really had any serious PTSD issues afterward. I, mean, I went through the stages like everybody else. Um, I can say this. I still think about it. But there's not so much anxiety. It doesn't keep me from doing stuff. I can fly again. I can, you know, function. I, um, but but the memory's still there. You, yeah. You, you never forget. Um, but you move on, and I think that's what I've done as best I can. How long did it take you to get back on the plane again after that? Yeah, this is going to sound really way more courageous than it was. But I got back on a plane the next afternoon. Uh, United had arranged crash happened at four o'clock in the afternoon. United sent a plane into Sioux City. I'm still trying to figure out how they landed that plane with all the chaos on the on all the, the runways. But they brought a plane back into Sioux City one day later, and anybody who wanted to go back to Denver on that plane could go. And so I signed up for that. I hadn't slept at all. Uh, I was out looking for Jay, my travel companion who died in the crash, as you said, and I hadn't slept at all. By the next afternoon, I was exhausted. Yeah. So I got on that plane. I found a seat. I buckled my seatbelt. And the next thing I remember, we're landing in Denver. I slept through the whole flight. So uh, like I wrote in a book, uh, I, I got bucked off the horse. I got back in the saddle and fell asleep for an hour and a half in that saddle, which is probably yeah. the best way it could have gone. Tell uh, listeners or, and uh, people watching about your book. You have like, I think you have three or four yeah. books out, correct? Yeah, I got a, I got a couple books. Um, the one that I wrote about the crash is called Chosen to Live. 
Um, and I can't believe it's been like 26 years since that book has come out. I just, I still can't believe it's been that long, but uh, Chosen to Live is about the crash and life subsequent to it. I've written a Christian um, outreach uh, man, kind of manual that's called The Extravagant Gift, and then a process of writing another book. Um, I've got this big bike race coming up, and if I finish that, I'm going to write another book and, and include that in it. I saw you're going across country, across Colorado. What was it now? It's a race across America. It's the whole, it's the whole country. From yeah, what state states. to what state? Yeah, uh, from uh, California, from San Diego to Annapolis, Maryland. Wow. 3,000 3, 060 miles that you have to finish in 12 days. So you got to do at least 250 a day. So that's well, if you happen to travel crazy. through Louisville, Kentucky, let me know and I'll hand you a water. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. You got it. That's unbelievable. Um, so go, now you talk about the extravagant gift for the Christian book. Like, do you consider what you have in your life now, the extravagant gift, just to keep being able to, to keep going? Like you survived this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think not only keep going, Kevin, but, but Kevin, but achieve dreams and, and live to live that life you want to live and, you know, start uh, Xing off your bucket list. So um, I, I think a lot of people have just been sort of um, captured by this by this crash, those who have survived, my fellow survivors, haven't been able to move on and haven't achieved their dreams. And, and that's what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to just live. I want to live a full life. And that's yeah. what I'm, I'm trying to do in my remaining years because I got my life given back to me. I, had a, I posted this on my Instagram and I had a lot of feedback on inboxes and comments about doing this video with you today. It was everyone couldn't wait, including a pilot who actually met Captain Haynes on a few on three occasions, I believe. Yeah. And it was, he, he was really wanting to hear this interview. So I'm uh, happy to do this with you. One of the things I wanted to ask you to go, to go back a little bit before, after the explosion happened on the, the engine, um, like what was, now this might sound cliche, but your mindset as far as like, I know we said, oh shit, this is it. But like when you, when it was, when you were still at 40 plus minutes of this crazy flying in the sky, I'm sure it was probably, unbelievable turbulence and whatnot and like what was going through your mind like did I say all the love yous did I say goodbyes and did I leave anything behind or you know what I mean yeah. I always I always wanted to leave a yeah. legacy in a roundabout way of something and in my yeah. mind I think that's what be going through my head like oh my god like, did I tell my daughter that I love her enough or did yeah. I tell my wife you know yeah yeah you know there was I think because we had so much time, we had 45 minutes with the time of the explosion and we, and we crash landed knowing we were going to crash. Captain Haynes made it very clear to everybody, which we all appreciated. But I think everything goes through your head. You think about your life, uh, regrets, things you feel good about. You think about the future. Uh, I had been married four years. The last three words I said to my wife that day were, I love you. So I thought, well, that that's in place. That's uh, I've said the right thing to my wife. If I'm ever going to see her again, because um, I thought I was it. I, I, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I just the thought hit me that people don't survive plane crashes, and I knew we were going to crash. So I thought that was it. Um, I had some regrets. I wanted to be a father. My 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 wife and I hadn't had any kids yet, and I realized how much I was looking forward to that. Um, but the, but I felt pretty good about things. Um, I had two sisters who died at birth. They were preemies, oh, wow. and I was excited about meeting them maybe some you know very soon so um you think about everything but yeah i think it, what i thought about the most at the end was uh prayers for my wife that she would be able to move on and be okay she would never kevin find somebody as great as me right no, After no. but no <laughs> no my, my but my my prayer was that she could she could move forward and 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 be okay with all this what a man i, I cannot imagine I, I know I keep using that word a lot. I can't imagine, because I, I, I don't think any human being can imagine what they would go through, what they would think of, what, the, what would happen in the very end. But to survive that, and like I said, everyone who's watching this can watch the video. There's several YouTube videos of the actual crash. It's only seen by that one film crew that just happened to get there and filmed yeah. it. And it almost landed straight. Like it yeah. almost landed. So that last, like... 30 seconds it tilted and they yeah. said they could not get it to go back up in time enough yeah. and it clipped the wing but yeah. it's just oh my gosh and time i watch that video it's like it's it brings chills to you it rocks you to your core and i think more people need to hear your story because it's not just about a plane crash in general or a an engine failure it's about what you were going through at the time what you did then what you did in the plane after it crashed saving a, a, a baby and then what you're doing with your life now. 
I mean, yeah. you wrote books about surviving an extravagant gift and how to keep moving. And now you're going to do, you're 61 years old, I believe now, right? Yeah. Yeah. 60 you're going to go 3000 plus miles <laughs> <laughs> from um, coast to coast on a bicycle. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 I've always kind of had this adventure kind of uh, gene in me. I think I've always wanted to do new things, but Kevin, after surviving this plane crash, and by the way, everybody around me did not. I mean, everybody around me died. The guy on my left to the seat right here where, you know, we're touching each other. He's dead. His wife is dead. The woman in front of me, the guy behind me, a uh, guy across the aisle. I mean, everybody around me in that crash died. Jay, my buddy, seven rows back, 112 people died. I, I just, I got a second chance at this. I got life given back to me and I want to make the most of it. And I said, this is somebody the other day. And I think this kind of sums it up for me. Um, everybody dies but not everybody really lives. Right. I want to really, I want to really live. I, I, I want to really, chance. really, yeah, I want to, I just, I want to make the most of it. I really do. That's incredible, man. That is an incredible story. And mm -hmm. I, I won't keep your, your day going. I know you've, yeah, I just, I want to thank you so much for doing this interview. Cause I, yeah. I want, I've been wanting to, when I saw your story on that interview, I was like, I want to reach out to this guy. I want to hear his side of it. I want to hear an actual, what happened, the mindset of what everything involved, because Human curiosity is, you know, everyone's going to know or want to know what happens in that type of circumstance because not everyone's been in anything like that. Um, my my wife now, uh, she lost her father when she was only seven years old in a plane crash. It was a private wow. plane and wow. there was only four people on board. And her stepfather now was supposed to be on that plane also. And wow. it was just incredible. And at our wedding, the one survivor of that plane crash um gave her the biggest hug and said it should have been me not your dad that was that died on that and wow. they wow. raised and cried and I asked her what was said and she told me I didn't even hear it but I saw the the hug and I just like oh my god like it, it tore me up wow. and wow. But anyway, that's great yeah mm. so to hear mm. your story is incredible and I can't wait to, mm. to share this video with everyone and thank you again Jerry for doing this today yeah absolutely I enjoyed it thanks for having me on I really appreciate You're welcome. it welcome you have an awesome day, my friend. And yeah, thank you. God bless and keep sharing your story. I'll do it. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Jerry. Bye.